Hello everyone. Good evening and good morning to Dr. Louis. Wishing one and all a very warm namaste. Einstein once famously said, there are two ways to live your life. One, as though nothing is a miracle and the other, as though everything is a miracle. In this technological age, it is nothing less than a miracle that someone of the stature of Dr. Louis Mercury is able to share his time and experience with the audiences sitting across the globe. TK Life and myself, Dr. Sanjeev Kaur, is deeply grateful for his generous gift of time and gift of knowledge and wisdom that Dr. Mercury has offered today evening for us. It is my absolute honor to welcome today's guest, Dr. Louis Mercury. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation, sir. As we can see, the as you can see the credentials of Dr. Mercury on the slide, he is uh, uh, he's a cum laude graduate of Georgetown University School of uh, School of Dentistry. He has re received a certification of masters. He's a life member of Association of American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. He, uh, but besides that, in 2011, he was awarded honorary fellowship in Royal College of Surgeons of England. But the, uh, the very interesting uh, contribution has been Dr. Louis Mercury Lifetime Achievement Award, which was, uh, which was sought by American Association, American Society of PMD Surgeons in 2020, of which he was the inaugural recipient. Dr. Mercury is presently a visiting professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Rush University Medical Center, Chicago. When uh, this, this is the obvious part of his uh, uh, his introduction, but when I uh, when I requested him for some of the uh, more intimate um, uh, inquiries of his life, and uh, answer to my questions were whether what are his interests, what are his professional and personal interests. And Dr. Mercury was very kind enough to share with me his uh, details. Dr. Mercury has always been interested in how and why things work, as well as what can be done to make them work better. He sees research as the only way to do this. He, uh, in his personal time, he enjoys reading history, watching sports, such as ice hockey, American football, and he loves cooking at the end of the day. And on asking whether, what are the advice that he would like to give to young maxillofacial surgeons or trainees? There are three advices that Dr. Mercury would like to offer to, his, to the uh, coming generation of maxillofacial surgeons. According to him, residency program is to teach the basics of surgery. Then in their practices, if the, uh, if the surgeons only practice what they have learned in their training, they are neither doing themselves or their patients any favor. Therefore, they must be constant students throughout their life by attending meetings, continuing education courses, interacting with well-educated colleagues from all professions. And as the field of surgery grows and expands constantly, they, they spend time constantly reading the evidence-based literature. According to him, he says that you can teach surgery, you can teach anyone how to do a surgery, but what makes one a surgeon is that they have the knowledge base to make the proper diagnosis, decide on the proper treatment, and be able to deal with inevitable complications that occur during and after the surgery. On each day of training, no matter the rotation, write down the case or the fact that they come across, which may be a little unfamiliar or new. Go home in that evening, look for the list and concentrate. Do your web search, do your research on the, uh, the new finding that you have come across on that day. That is the best way to understand and retain the new knowledge and associate it with specific situation or case. Basically, he's talking about case-based learning. So, these are some interesting uh, thoughts and very learning thoughts that Dr. Mercury has shared with us. This says, and, and, um, and on this evening, we will be accompanied, Dr. Mercury will be accompanied by my dear friend and uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Sonal Anchalia, who will be moderating this session. 
Dr. Sonal Anshalia is a well-known name in, my, in our profession in this country. And I would like to extend my warm welcome to Dr. Anshalia. Dr. Anshalia is a professor and head Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, GDC, Government Dental College, Ahmedabad. She has 18 years of teaching experience with a PG, PhD degree. She's also an executive committee member of Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons of India. She's a founder member of PMJ Surgeons, uh, Indian Society of PMJ Surgeons. She has various accolades to her name. The most important and the recent one is the, where, is the place where she's been felicitated uh, by uh, AOMSI in 2002 for the service of mankind for her work in, in the field of mucor mycosis. Now, this is about our uh, speaker and presenter today. But what, uh, and what about the topic? The topic that we are going to discuss is, is the position of TMJ disc a problem or a solution? So when it comes to this topic, I have an interesting insight to share with my, uh, with my attendees. In 17th century, uh, an English physician, Thomas Sinham, sometimes referred to as English Hippocrates, Hippocrates as well, said, that a disease was something waiting to be found, which existed independent of the observer. It is, the, it is like a cancer that grows and makes itself known, rendering the person sick, whether the doctor defines it or not. Whereas illness is an another matter altogether. It's the perception of how one feels and does not need to be associated with a disease. That is, it does not need an objective pathology to exist. Illness is defined by the person who has it and the doctor who gives it a name. And as such, it will be inherently a cultural phenomenon. Normal depends on the community in which you live. Now, the question that we will be dabbling today is whether TMD is a disease or an illness. And because we have this very, very, uh, very, very mystical, very, very confusing uh, situation around this condition, we, would, we have also been in a place to cause a lot of iatrogenic harm to our patients, where 20 to 30 percent of the patients have a disc which is not in place, but they are uh, asymptomatic. So how do you understand this condition? This is what Dr. Mercury will be discussing with us today. The virtual stage is all yours, sir. I hope you have a good evening with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I will be, uh, if you can take down, I'll put my screen up. Yes, yes, I'm stopping the screen share. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy and pleased to be able to uh, do this presentation for you. Um, as I said earlier, um, I, I think one of the good things that's come out of the pandemic is to be able to share knowledge across continents. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity uh, for all of you to hear what we have to say. The topic today is, uh, is the position of the TMJ disc the problem or the solution? This is uh, the two institutions that I uh, presently have faculty positions in. I practiced oral and maxillofacial surgery for over 45 years, full scope. Uh, the last uh, 10 to 15 years of which were mainly associated with total joint reconstruction. Um, I was fortunate enough to be invited to join the faculties of these two universities, which lie very close to each other in the city of Chicago. And my, my research has mainly been involved with putting the principles of orthopedic surgery into temporal mandibular joint, specifically in material science and in osteoarthritis. This is my disclosure. I am a clinical consultant for Stryker. Today's topic is, as, as was alluded to, is a very complex topic. Um, and very controversial. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I'd like you to think outside the box. And what I mean by thinking outside the box is 
outside the box thinking requires openness to new ways of seeing the world and a willingness to explore. In the box thinkers believe that every problem needs only one solution. Therefore, finding more than one possible solution is a waste of time. So I'm hoping that for the next 45 minutes, you'll be an out, out of the box thinker and sort of listen to what I say. And you don't have to, to agree with it, but hopefully it will give you something to think about. We're going to talk about TMJ dis displacement, which I think is a better term than internal derangement. Where does the term internal derangement come from? Well, actually, the term was first used by John Hay back in 1814. Uh, and he was referring to the knee. When the, when the meniscus in the knee was torn, he called it an internal derangement. It didn't get associated with the temporal mandibular joint until Sir Astley Cooper, who was a general surgeon, called it TMJ disc internal derangement. And surgery wasn't done for it until 1887 by Annandale, who corrected a disc displacement in a young female patient. All he said in his Lancet report was that the patient did well. There was no follow-up, nothing. And he tied the disc back using horsehair. Remember, anesthesia didn't start uh, until well after this. So how this was done, probably under chloroform, is really kind of interesting. Uh, the first discectomy was done by Lanz in 1906. And then Pringle talked about TMJ clicking was due to this displacement. Ashurst talked about the snapping jaw. And Wakely was the first one to say that TMJ pain was due to displacement of the mandibular cartilage. So you can see there's a long history behind TMJ disc displacement. But it wasn't until the 1970s, between 1972 and 1979, that Bill Farah and McCarty came along and said that internal derangement was the anatomical solution to all TMJ problems. And Clyde Wilkes in Minnesota said that internal derangement results in progressive TMJ degeneration or osteoarthritis. Now, I spent a week with Clyde Wilkes up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, back in the, the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and I watched him perform arthrograms and um, uh, arth uh, disc replacement, disc uh, repositionings. And I went back to my practice and did 400 uh, over the next eight years. I followed these patients closely and I found out that they didn't do as well as I had expected. And this is what got me to start thinking about where the disc belongs in this whole spectrum of temporomandibular joint disease. Frank Dolwood came along in the 90s and talked about surgical management of TMJ internal derangement, disc repositioning. Marit Nietzsche from Israel did some really good work on TMJ arthrocentesis along with Frank Dolwood. And then Bruce Sanders and a number of other people, Joe McCain and the like, have brought arthroscopy to the forefront of our specialty. And the one thing that we've learned from arthroscopy is the internal workings of the, of the joint. So Clyde Wilkes developed this classification system for internal derangement that you're all familiar with. And this, uh, Sid Bronstein and Ralph Merrill said, you know, maybe we ought to be looking at the position of the disc in its relationship to the condyle, which they called roofing how much of the condyle is covered by the disc. So they developed this uh, uh, staging system, which never really gained much traction. And then finally, Ahmed and Schiffman came up with this image-based uh, analysis for TMJ disc position based on the MRI, which is the most commonly used uh, radiographic technique to look at the TMJ disc. So the perception that Wilkes gave us 
was that internal derangement represents a basic pathologic entity responsible for all clinical manifestations of TMJ pain and dysfunction, and that it progressed to an advanced degenerative change if it was not treated. So everybody believed that because as, you know, as a dentists, as physicians, we're always looking for the answer. And we know that things are shades of gray. They're not all black and white. And that most things in medicine are managed, not cured, like hypertension, diabetes, thyroid disease. They're all managed. Nothing is cured. Cancer is not cured. It's managed. And unfortunately, because of our dental background, we think we can cure everything. Because if you have caries in the tooth, you drill out the caries and you put a filling in, and that cures that. If you have periodontal disease, you scrape away the tooth, scrape away the junk from around the tooth, and you cure periodontal disease. And if you don't, then you really cure it by taking the tooth out. So, you know, there's more than one way to look at things. And that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to look at this in a little bit different way because wide acceptance of an idea is not proof of its validity. Because if you only believe one thing, when you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you think that the disc is the answer to all temperamentibular joint problems, everything you do, particularly as a surgeon, will center around the disc and you miss the real causes of the problem. I'm gonna illustrate this by a case. This is a very attractive young 35 year old lady who came to see me. She's a graphic artist, means that she draws pictures. She's had a headache for 10 years. She went to see a neurologist. The neurologist told her, put her on medication and said, it has to be managed. There's no cure. Well, she goes to a dentist to get her teeth cleaned. She tells him about the headache. He says, well, you may have TMJ problems. So I'm gonna send you to an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. She goes to an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. She has a click in her joint. He says, there's the answer. Because I've got a hammer, you look like a nail. Let's do an MRI. Here's her MRI. She's got bilateral anterior displaced discs. You can see by the, the red arrow. She undergoes arthrocentesis, she gets no better. Arthroscopy, she gets no better. She undergoes disc plication, she does no better. She undergoes discectomy, she does no better. She undergoes orthognathic surgery. She does no better. She does high condylectomy. She undergoes basically 10 operations and she's worse than when she started. I see her and she's ankylosed. And this is what she looks like, okay? Now she's still an attractive lady, but she's undergone 10 operations. The last of which I did uh, total joint replacements on because she's ankylosed. So she came to visit me on one of her post-op visits. And I said, she's a graphic artist, she draws pictures. And she says, this is what I look like. So this is what I think I look like after all of this. This is the iatrogenic TMJ patient. We caused this. We caused this because we thought, and I'm using we in the general term because I don't believe it, but we thought as a profession, that the disc was the problem. And all that she had done was related to the disc. So I got to thinking, you know, we need to start looking into this. And research is formalized curiosity. I'm a curious person. I like to find out why things and how things work, as we said earlier. So let's poke around and do some prying and see what's going on here. Now, you've all seen this patient. This is an 83-year-old man who comes in to have central incisor extracted. We're not gonna to touch this too. He's 83 years old. But what do you notice? Look at his, look at his condyles, they're flat. You know, he's got, he's got degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis. And when he opens and closes his mouth, it crackles and crunches. And you ask him, do you, do you ever have pain? <laughs> well, you know, it makes noise, but I, I don't hurt. This is primary 
degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis. And we're going to talk about this in my next presentation in a few weeks. Um, but what we learned from this, because we see this every day, is that growth, gross morphologic abnormalities can be present in the absence of TMJ pain and dysfunction. And as I progress through my slides, you're going to see references to every one of these. And I know this is being recorded, so you can go back and look up all these references, because this is an evidence-based presentation. So Solberg and Rowan said, you know, we need to look at, at this displacement. So, well, let's look at it in cadavers. And what they did was they operated cadavers and they found that 56% of the cadavers that they operated on had this displacement. Well, we don't know the histories of these, these cadavers. Uh, we don't know anything other than the fact that they're disc displaced. Well, let's look at asymptomatic volunteers. What percentage of asymptomatic people walking around have disc displacement? And these are, these are just a few of the references to that. 23 to 35% of asymptomatic people have displaced discs. I had an MRI done on myself just to see what it was like to get the MRI for a TMJ. And I have bilateral displaced discs. I have never had a problem with my TM joints. So the MRI is a valuable method for assessing TMJ structures. But MRI images should be considered in association with the clinical signs and symptoms for the diagnosis and management of TMD. And our feeling, and Manfredini's feeling, is that we sometimes overdiagnose this displacement when an MRI is the only diagnostic test used, as in the patient I showed you earlier. Also, it's been shown that there are no factors associated with the concomitant presence of arthralgia in patients with disc displacement with reduction. So what's really going on? What, what do we think could be going on? Let's do a reality check. Way back in 1993, Bont and the group from Grunigan said that disc displacement may represent extremes of normal variation. Internal derangement may be a sign of a range of conditions rather than a single entity. In 1994, Wild, Wild Widenham said that internal derangement does not always cause clinical symptoms, obviously, since 23 to 35% of the people have it. But it's the inflammatory changes in the joint that are more likely important in the development of symptoms than is disc displacement itself. I'm involved in orthopedics now. Uh, I've always felt that the TM joint is like every other joint in the body. It obeys all the same laws as every joint in the body. It is not the holy grail of the, of the, of the body. Um, it, it is a joint like other joints. And this is what orthopedic surgeons do. It's a branch of medicine concerned with the acute, chronic, traumatic, and overuse injuries and other disorders of the musculoskeletal system. That's exactly what we do with the temporomandibular joint because it is part of the musculoskeletal system. So I'm going to talk about this from an orthopedic standpoint because I, I firmly believe this is where we belong. We belong on the orthopedic side of this problem. We're going to talk about biomechanical instability because this is the way orthopedic surgeons talk about joints. They're the problems with these joints, the appendicular skeleton, arms and legs and things, is biomechanical instability. Definition of biomechanics is the science concerned with the internal and external forces acting on the human body and the effects produced by those forces. An instability is a, is a result of uh, a, a system is considered unstable if at least one of the variables is unstable. So biomechanical instability. When you put extra strength, extra stress on the articular structures or the surrounding joint structures, you get soft tissue damage 
or tears, joint degeneration and pain. That's exactly what happens to the temporal mandibular joint. Joints begin to degenerate or break down when the destructive processes exceed the reparative processes. And the result is joint instability and disabling chronic musculoskeletal pain. That's in orthopedics. That's exactly what happens to the temporal mandibular joint. Chuck Nylon was a very good friend. Chuck was one of the brightest people I've ever met in my life. Chuck unfortunately succumbed to brain cancer back in 2007, but his work was groundbreaking in the pathophysiology of temporal mandibular joint problems. And unfortunately, a lot of it was lost when he was lost. Back in 1995, he said that joints, particularly the temporal mandibular joint, has an adaptive capacity. When you have mechanical stress on a joint, you either get an adaptive response or a maladaptive response. And these variables uh, are, uh, affect the joint as well. Age, sympathetic tone, hormones, and previous injury. They have an effect on whether you have an adaptive response or a maladaptive response. Eiji Tanaka, Michael Dedimore, and myself uh, wrote this paper, which has had now, I think, over 10,000 reads, um, has become sort of a classic paper when we talk about degenerative disorders of the temporal mandibular joint. We took some of uh, Chuck's work uh, as we developed this paper. So if you look at the left-hand side of this picture, in a normal joint where you have normal loading, uh, you get functional remodeling of the temporal mandibular joint because it has an adaptive capacity. The articular cartilage has adaptive capacity. But when you exceed that load through macro trauma, parafunction, functional overloading, or increased joint friction, because there's a change in synovial fluid, which we'll discuss in a moment, that it, you exceed the adaptive capacity of that joint and you get dysfunctional remodeling of the articular cartilage, which leads to the development of pro-inflammatory cytokines and cartilage breakdown. And I'm gonna talk about this in much more detail in the next few slides. This maladaptive response to mechanical stress leads to an inflammatory cascade. And I'll, I'll discuss the inflammatory cascade in the next slide. But that leads to impaired cellular function, tissue damage, and synovitis. Synovitis is the key to the problem. You get a reduction in lubrication and nutrient supply because this is the way the cartilage gets its nutrients is through the synovial fluid. So if you change the lubrication with the synovial fluid, you get a change in nutrient supply to the joint. This is the inflammatory cascade. All right, and I'm not gonna go through each one of these things because it's a very involved and very complex system, but they all lead to tissue destruction and once again, impaired lubrication. So this is the bottom part of our, our cartoon where we lead to the production of cytokines leading to cartilage breakdown. But in a nutshell, biomechanical instability results from joint trauma, overload, or maladaptive response. You get the inflammatory cascade, synovitis, impaired lubrication and nutrition, impaired biomechanics, increased synovitis, and limited mobility. And that limited mobility is due to the formation of adhesions. And those of you who do arthroscopy have seen those adhesions. Those are the result of the development of synovitis. So synovitis is the key to the whole thing. As was said back in 1993 and 94, that it's inflammation that's the key. It's not dis displacement. Now dis displacement, as we'll see, can cause synovitis, but synovitis is the problem. And so Howard Israel, who's a very good friend of mine, who's at uh, Columbia in New York, um, and uh, we worked on this sort of system uh, that shows you a hypothesis of the pathogenic pathways leading to 
TMJ biomechanical instability. And you'll see that this displacement is down here. It's not up here. It's, it's the result, not the cause. And you can take your time and look through this uh, as you review this uh, presentation as it's recorded. So Howard said that internal derangement of the temporal mandibular joint is not a disease, but a nonspecific sign of tissue failure leading to biomechanical instability of the joint. It's usually caused by mechanical overloading leading to inflammatory and degenerative changes. It can also be caused by systemic arthropathy or local tissue, uh, localized atypical arth arthropathy. Things like rheumatoid, um, uh, seritic uh, arthritis, and uh, another controversial topic, uh, idiopathic condyl resorption, which I believe is a form of uh, JIA. And that's a topic for another day. So where does disc displacement fit into the scheme? This displacement does happen. There's no question about it. Um, but where does it fit in this whole scheme? The relationship of TMJ pain and MRI findings, the multivariate, this multivariate analysis did not show TMJ pain correlating with reduction of anterior disc displacement or mandibular condyle morphology. So back like we showed earlier with that 83-year-old man, Sometimes you have changes in the joint that have nothing to do with the pain associated with these patients. But we do know the histologic examination has confirmed, and we see in, in, in our arthroscopy, that vascularity and inflammatory reactions are seen in the synovium and posterior distal attachment of NTMJ pathology. So we know that synovitis is a true thing. We also know the synovitis is, produces a uh, joint effusion to see in this T2. Changes in synovial fluid can increase friction, which can cause, uh, can lead to joint degeneration. Because the synovial fluid, as I said earlier, is important for nutrition of the cartilage. If you change the consistency of the synovial fluid, uh, it changes the nutrition and leads to further tissue breakdown. So let's look at joint mechanics. This is a very simple equation. Joint plus muscles equal motion plus function. A breakdown in any one of the first joint or muscles leads to poor motion and poor function. Simple equation. So impairment of <clears throat> condylar movement is the result of the development of synovitis within the joint capsule and Hilton's orthopedic law. What is Hilton's orthopedic law? The nerves that innervate the joint also innervate the muscles that move that joint as well as the overlying skin. For the temporal mandibular joint, it's the trigeminal nerve. And this is a self-protection law. If a joint hurts, the muscles that move that joint stop moving the joint. You've all experienced this. If you've hurt your knee or your elbow, you'll notice that the muscles around that joint start to hurt. And they, you can't move the joint because those muscles tighten up. That's exactly what happens to the TM joint. And there's synovitis within the joint, the patient has difficulty opening their mouth, or we call it trismus. It was, became very obvious to me um, when in about the middle of operating those 400 joints for disc displacement many years ago, I noticed when I opened the joint, two things. One, that once the patient was asleep, it was real easy to move the joint. Number two, the synovial fluid looked more like olive oil than it than like you know water like it should be so i was noticing two things that the disc wasn't that little piece of cartilage wasn't stopping people from opening their mouths 
So the term closed lock is a, is a really stupid term and should be eliminated from our vocabulary. Um, and that the synovial fluid did change. And there was tremendous synovitis in these joints. They were hot red joints. So it comes to, it, it makes sense that Hilton's law would take effect. Synovial synovitis causing through a reflex mechanism through the trigeminal nerve, a protection of the joint by causing trismus. <clears throat> so impairment of pendular movement equals pain, dysfunction, and noise. So the disc acts like a speed bump. And if the condyle has to jump over this disc or has to push the disc forward, it creates an inflammatory response. That inflammatory response by Hilton's law creates the trismus that we see. It's not the disc that's stopping the patient from opening the mouth, it's their muscles. Because if you sedate them or put them to sleep, they open their mouth. If you restore condylar movement, you can improve signs and symptoms. It's like driving down a straight road. You don't have any bump anymore. So if you get the disc out of the way or get the disc to function, you get this nice smooth path. So mobilization of the disc is of more importance. And, and Rene Deleu uh, wrote this back in 2008 that for the reduction of signs and symptoms in internal derangement, then is anatomically correct positioning of the disc. It's more important to get the disc moving than putting it in the right position. Therefore, this function is more important than disc position. Getting the disc moving so it isn't that speed bump, it doesn't create the inflammation in the joint is the most important thing. So what about, what do we do with this displacement with reduction? <clears throat> well, this paper showed that no treatment is necessary. Okay? This displacement with reduction is a clicking joint. We don't operate clicking joints. There's no reason to operate a clicking joint. 40% of the population click. And there have been no studies that show that if you have a clicking joint, you're gonna proceed on to an internal derangement or disc displacement. There are some patients that do, but the vast majority do not. What about disc displacement without reduction? As I'll show you, there is really insufficient evidence to support the use of minimally invasive or invasive surgical interventions for disc displacement without reduction, because the disc has already moved forward. What about disc reposition? The scientific evidence regarding the effectiveness of disc reposition is scarce. And look who wrote this. Now, Larry's a very good friend of mine. We've, we've spoken together and I've traveled with Larry on a number of occasions. Um, but as you'll see, there's very little scientific evidence that supports repositioning discs. And the reason why there's a lack of high evidence this is limited long-term studies. There are some studies now coming out of China uh, for disc repositioning with you know, MRIs that show the disc in place a few months later, but does it stay there? There's no studies that compare the efficacy of disc repositioning to other surgical techniques. There's a lack of consistency in the outcomes. The studies are not, do not describe techniques used. Some do, some don't. There's, there's the use of uh, MyTech Anchor. There's the Arthroscopic Olympics where you do this through an arthroscope. But there are operated specific, operator specific techniques. You have to be a level three arthroscopist to be able to reposition a disc using an arthroscope. You have to have done many, many disc repositioning procedures open to be able to do it properly with the, with the MyTech anchor. So because of the limited number of studies and evidence, further prospective evaluation in a larger patient population with longer follow-up periods is required to more accurately predict the benefits of disc repositioning. Now, if you are a believer in disc repositioning, 
you have lower chances of success in older patients, patients with a longer history of disc displacement, and patients with advanced Wilk staging. All of that makes sense when you consider the pathophysiology of it. Why they say previous orthodontic treatment, I have no idea. We did a study uh, looking at discectomy. So let's talk about discectomy. Should we be doing discectomy? Well, in this study, the surgeons who responded uh, did not employ TMJ discectomy in most cases for TMJ internal derangement. Discectomy was considered useful for disc perforation for late stage Wilkes procedures or for persistent uh, uh, symptomatic disc displacement without reduction in an attempt to avoid alloplastic temporomandibular joint replacement. That's what that stands for. Now, my good friend, uh, Gary Warburton, uh, who you all know, um, proposed this algorithm for management of disc displacement. And I think this is really good. I think this is a really good uh, except. I'm not so sure about this area, the level three arthroscopy, because you have to be a level three arthroscopist to be able to do this. So I sort of question that, but I, I like the rest of this as an algorithm. What are the chances of post-discectomy total joint replacement? The success rate of discectomy in this study was 75%. This, was, this paper was published last year. Um, the conversion rate from TMJ discectomy to total joint replacement was about 12%, which is pretty good. Um, so that's, that's your, your, your chances of having to go to total joint replacement after discectomy. TMJ's disorders impact on pain, function, and disability. The cross-sectional study, the first study there, uh, published in 2015, showed no association between this status and TMD as represented by pain, jaw function, and disability. This suggests that TMJ disc disorders have minimal impact on patients' pain, function, and disability. This also suggests in the second study by Schiffman that treatments focused on TMJ disc disorders, such as surgery, may have limited impact on patients' reported outcomes. There's a suboptimal quality of literature for all of these procedures, because there are few, if any, random clinical trials. We're mixing up diagnoses. We're taking patients with woke stage two to woke stage five, and we mix them all up. We don't say which stage we're dealing with. And we know that with the passage of time, and there are a number of studies that have shown this, with the passage of time, patients get better that have disc displacements. So why do we operate on it? Well, probably because they force us to. So the idea is the primary management option should be conservative, okay? We should be using orthotics or oral appliances. I hate the word splint. A splint is something that you use with a broken bone. It's not what you use in a patient's mouth. Use an orthotic or an oral appliance. We got to get rid of that term as well. Um, and you use things like arthrocentesis. And why do you do arthrocentesis? To get rid of the cytokines, to stop the inflammatory response. We use non steroidal anti inflammatories for the same reason. Okay. Start out simple. Why do we do arthroscopy? We move to the next level of management in patients who have that stuck disc or the disc that's in the way, they have to get moving. So we do lysis and lavage, simple procedure. We don't jump to disc repositioning. We don't jump to discectomy. Now discectomy may be important in late stage disease, 
as was discussed earlier, hole in the in the disc. Disc is complete ball. Can't move it. It's stuck. It's that big speed bump that creates the synovitis that we talked about earlier. So should we be recapturing the disc? No, I don't think that's important. Disc function is more important than disc position. This is a haiku. When your disc is at risk, choose carefully who you appoint to fix your joint. That's from Ed Selvin, who's a, a oral surgeon at the Mass General in Boston, associated with Harvard. When your disc is at risk, choose carefully who you appoint to fix your joint. These are a couple of pearls. In, in our country, when you finish a lecture, you have to give the audience um, things to take home. The two things I would like you to take home from this presentation are internal derangement of the temporal mandibular joint is not a disease, but a specific sign of tissue failure leading to biomechanical instability of the joint. It's the synovitis that's the problem. Deal with the synovitis early with conservative management then it doesn't become a problem. Secondly, dysfunction is more important than disposition. So is the position of the disc really the problem or is it the solution? No, but hopefully this has given you something to think about because the important thing is to never stop questioning. Once we stop questioning, we're in trouble because if you only believe one thing, you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail and you're gonna end up with that patient that I showed you earlier, uh, who ended up uh, looking, thinking that she looked uh, worse than she really did. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your interest and attention and for the privilege of your time this evening. Um, this is a, a sculpture that was done by an Indian sculptor that sits in the Millennium Park here in Chicago. It's called Cloud Gate um, or the Bean. Uh, and I like to end this particular lecture with this because it looks like a TMJ disc, which is sitting where it belongs outside the joint. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If you have any questions that are not answered today, that's my email address. I'll be happy to answer those questions. So thank you again. And uh, let's have some questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Dr. Mercurai, for such a wonderful presentation. Some of, some of us have seen this presentation on the YouTube. And uh, today, this discussion will bring the difference in the presentation that we will have. Uh, until we wait for the audiences to uh, come up with the questions, Dr. Sonal Anchalia, who is the moderator of the session, has lined up a couple of uh, discussion points with you. Dr. Anchalia, please uh, address the poll. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation, sir. Um, if you don't mind, maybe we could split the, split our discussion into two two sections, really, sir. One would be for maybe the younger the trainees who would possibly see have have been uh, watching or who would watch the recorded session later. So one, initially, if you could kind of get to the uh, the questions which are really important as uh, far as the basics of uh, uh, this displacement are concerned and then uh, the in the second section we could come to the questions that really uh, kind of stem from uh, what you spoke about today sir so is that okay sir if we talk about the basics now first sure whatever you want right sir so uh, again for the benefit of the training sir uh, in your expert opinion what would really be the best way of distinguishing uh, between uh, orofacial pain of muscular origin versus pain maybe uh, from an intra-articular uh, source, you know? So which is the best method, clinical assessment, or is it the diagnostic block, or is it the Mayhans test? Which one would you say is uh, That's best? a very, very good basic question. Um, the one thing I did um, was was use Parker Mayhans trick, uh, where, yeah. where you ask the patient to point to 
where the pain is. And if the patient takes their hand and puts it over the side of their face, okay, it's most likely muscular so, pain. If okay. they take their finger and point to the joint, it's most likely intraarticular. Now, the way you test for that is you take a tongue blade and you put the tongue blade in the patient's mouth, have them bite down on it on one side. If the pain worsens on the side where you have the tongue blade, okay, on the, so, let's say my right side, um, yes. then it's muscular pain. If so, you put the tongue blade on the contralateral side or the opposite side, have them bite down and it's, they point to the joint, then it's most likely the joint because what that's done is push the condyle into the synovium and causing the pain. So that's a simple, simple way to deal with that. Uh, it doesn't work all the time, but it's simple. Yes. Now, the other way of doing it is uh, with diagnostic blocks. Um, if you think, if you're, because what happens is, because of Hilton's law, if there's an intraarticular problem, it can cause muscular pain because yes. you're dealing with the muscles that are reacting no. to the synovitis. So if you want to know if it's primary muscle or primary joint, you use a diagnostic block in the joint. And I recommend using local anesthesia without vasoconstrictor, okay? Um, because you don't want it to last for a long period of time. Let it sit there for a good three to five minutes, and then use a, either a visual analog scale or a Likert scale and have the patient scale their pain. From, and if you've eliminated 75% of the patient's pain with an intraarticular injection, the primary is the, the joint itself. Okay. Now, the other advantage of, of an intraarticular diagnostic block is that some of that anesthesia will seep out and it will affect the facial nerve. So the patient will, you know, can't close their eye or they can't pucker their lip. And it shows them what can happen if you do surgery. So it's a good demonstration of what can happen. A complication. You, you mean a complication of the surgery? A complication, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. So it's a good, you know, it's a good way to, to and that's another reason for not using uh, the laser constrictor. So I think so those two ways. You, uh, so can I ask you a connected question to this? Dr. Antilia mentioned about the uh, muscular pain. But can a TMD also be confused with neuralgic kind of pains like trigeminal neuralgia or atypical facial pain? In that case, can be, our picture becomes much more confusing. And how would you deal with that part? No. Well, yeah, I mean, if you, if you do all the diagnostic testing and the patient still has pain, I mean, you're, you're, you're dealing with a a chronic facial pain patient or a patient with uh, CMF. So, um, I, you know, those, I was fortunate enough to have a, a, a group. Uh, uh, and that's why I think it's important that you have not only yourself, uh, but you have other dentists that are interested in chronic facial pain, all facial pain specialists, neurologists, um, pathologists, uh, uh, psychiatrists, okay. psychologists to deal with. So that you have a team that works with these patients as well. Uh, but yeah, fibromyalgia is certainly one of the things that you have to think about. But patients will have, you know, to make the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, you have to have 18 parts of the body where the patient has pain. So they'll have pain in their, their other, you know, other parts of their body. The other thing that's really important in, with your diagnosis, uh, when you're taking a history from the patient, is comorbidities. Comorbidity. Most of these patients have comorbid conditions. They'll have IBS, they'll have chronic headache, they'll have allergies, you know, all of these uh, other um, uh, musculoskeletal type problems. Uh, and it's mainly women, uh, probably because of their autoimmune. You know, most autoimmune diseases affect women more than they do men. Uh, and there's a lot of thoughts about why that happens as an estrogen. Uh, you know, what, 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 why is this? Um, nobody really knows. We have a lot of estrogen receptors in the temporomandibular joint. Uh, we have a lot of estrogen receptors in other joints in the body. And one of the thoughts for osteoarthritis, which we'll talk about next time, is um, lower estrogen. Because uh, when you reach menopause, your estrogen level drops 
estrogen is protective of joints. And is that what's happening as part of osteoporosis? Uh, is it because of the drop in estrogen? And that's why one of the management options for uh, osteoarthritis in elderly women is giving them estrogen. But the problem with that is increasing breast cancer and all the other things that go along with it. So uh, it's a very complex system that we're dealing with here. So I, I'm getting a little bit off the subject, but um, I, I think it's important for the, the trainees to understand the importance of, of comorbidities. And comorbidities are found in the vast majority of TMD patients. Um, so you have to look at those when you take your history. And I have a whole lecture on that. So is, there, is there any... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, next question, please. So, so then uh, one of the other contributing factors would also be uh, stress, isn't it? So you, you said uh, you have a psychiatrist on the team also. So, uh, they, and you, ha you have a paper uh, on the uh, psychiatric aspect, the psychological aspect of uh, TMJ internal disease uh, displacement. Uh, you've written with uh, Dr. Laskin. Yes, well, we did, we had, um... We, uh, in, our, in our TMJ center, when I was in Virginia, we had uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, neurosurgeons, uh, the whole crowd. And we produced uh, seven PhDs out of that program. Most of them were, were psychological, uh, psychi uh, psychiatrists and uh, psychologists. And um, it was, uh, there are a number of papers that we produced uh, way back in the, in the 80s. Uh, but there's a definite, there's no question, there's a link between there stress and, right. and TMD. Right. I, I asked you this again, actually, specifically because this is a component in India, actually, which is, one, ignored quite a bit, even by doctors, and two, not really understood and not really accepted uh, so much by patients. You know, it's, it's more of a social stigma still, at least in our part of the world, that if, you know, if we talk to the patient and we say that we need to refer you to, the, to a psychologist, they suddenly can, you know, no, everything is okay with us. So, but then yeah. you, you say that there is a definite correlation and that we should all... Absolutely. Rest. There's no question about it. No question right, about it. Sir. Right, sir. Uh, I think the English... social aspect, the social cultural aspect of India is a very a huge contributing factor to such a huge number of temporomandibular joint disorders, particularly in women, because uh, yes. uh, in our society, which is mainly patriarchal society, the women are not able to express themselves, they're not able to do things the way they would like, and still somewhere there's a lot of restraint, so somewhere the emotions are putting strain on our joints, whether it is temporomandibular joint or our low back pain, because the, I think the incidence of low back pain is also very high. And somewhere orthopedics are realizing the importance that you don't operate every low back pain patient. Yeah. Similarly, you we don't operate a, every Yeah. We did a study um, many years ago, um, mm -hmm. and I can't remember if we published it or not. We had, we had a grant actually to do this, so we must have published it. But we showed that um, TMD patients were almost identical to low back pain patients. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Um, yeah. I mean, it, when you studied their MMPIs, their response to uh, the heat pain uh, was almost identical. Uh, and they yeah. also have a lot of comorbid factors, low back exactly. pain patients. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. if you look at the, uh, there's been a study done looking at displaced discs in low back pain patients, um, similar to the, the 23 to 35% of TMJ disc displacements, 23 to 35% of people with low back pain, yeah. have, or people with no low back pain, I'm sorry, without low back pain have displaced discs in their back. So it, it's a very analogous situation. Very analogous. I mean, I, I had that intuitive thought that there is a lot of analogy to the situation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Donal? Yeah, so, uh, so now, uh, since we've, we've kind of spoken about the history part and the clinical assessment part, maybe now we can go on to the radiographic assessment part. So many a times when uh, patients come to us, uh, a lot of uh, consultants first ask them for some sort of x-rays, even the basic x-rays, say OPG, uh, 
TMJ open mouth close mouth. You know those. So is that really a must? Does it give us anything? Uh, that uh, does it give us really any information into the joint, or should one directly go only for an MRI? Because there is this uh, European consortium. Uh, they came up with the sh the Schiffman's uh, criteria, wherein they said uh, that maybe MRI should be the first thing that is to be done. So your thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah. No, I I firmly believe that any patient who comes up with uh, symptoms. Um, uh, of TMD um, should have at a minimum a scalp film, which is an OPG, a uh, panorex, um, because there's other things that can, can occur. Uh, we saw uh, about 5% of our population uh, had uh, other problems other than TMJ um, associated with it. So that's a good scalp film. Um, whether you need an MRI on every single patient is, is a question. I mean, if the patient has, gives you this, the, the di gives you signs and symptoms of a dis displacement, uh, you don't need an MRI to, to show that. I mean, so why waste the money and the time on it? Um, you manage it. Um, <clears throat> now, in our society, because we're so litigious, um, people do MRI just to prove that they have a disc displacement. And an MRI uh, in our society is anywhere from three to $5,000. Um, it's a big dent. And, and in many insurance policies in our country, TMJ is not covered. Uh, it's a, it's a, a carve out. So patients have to pay for this on their own. Um, so it, it's, it's a real problem. So I, I don't believe everybody has to have an MRI. But I do believe everybody has to have a panorex. Now, if you see something on the panorex that looks funny from the bone standpoint, you don't get an MRI. You get a CBCT or a medical grade CT because you're looking at the bones. And we'll talk about this again when we talk about osteoarthritis. In fact, uh, when we take an PMJ MRI, most of our radiology colleagues cannot interpret them as we would like. And most of the time it gets overdiagnosed. It's so sensitive and uh, a technique that it gets overdiagnosed, small, small thing gets picked up. And uh, it's not much of value. That is what we have also realized. So Tonal, we have a couple of questions coming here from the audiences. Dr. Dinter, can we, would like to... Uh, yeah, Sarenji, yeah. Can we finish the initial part and then we come to those questions? Sure, sure, please. Dr. Dinkar, ready? please wait. Your turn will come. Thank you. Yeah. So next would be that now that we've diagnosed uh, both clinically and radiographically, then which is the point where we decide that, okay, now no more conservative therapy. This case, this particular case needs to go in for uh, surgery, sir. But how, how long do we wait with conservative uh, management? In terms of internal of dis displacement? Yes. Well, yeah, it, as I said, if we're dealing with stage four or five disease, uh, where you have a hole in the disc, or the disc looks like a big ball, or you've got tremendous inflammation in the joint because the disc is misshapen or is completely destroyed, um, then I think it's a, a reasonable approach to go in and do a discectomy. Um, I, towards the end of my practice, before I retired, I would do discectomies um, before I would do any, any anything else. And my conversion to total joint replacement was lower than the 12% that was quoted in that paper. I think it was about, you know, three or 4%. But what I did when I did a discectomy was I, I put a, a small piece of fat in the, in, the, uh, in the joint and I made the patient go through very active physical therapy afterwards. And so we got some really good results doing that. Um, so unfortunately, all the data for that was lost when the resident who was doing the study left and went into private practice and, and we erased all the data from his computer. So we lost all that data. Uh, so it's, it's, it's only anecdotal at this point. Right. So, so after discectomy, you, uh, you would advise, uh, you would advocate uh, fat to be the uh, uh, interpositional material of choice, sir, or uh, any yes. other things? No, uh, in fact, and it's simple to do because there's fat 
between the um, deep layer of the cervical uh, temporal fascia and you cut through the superficial layer of the temporal fascia yes. Yes, using the al yeah. Yes. The next layer down, if you cut through that, you get fat. And so, so you, you get take fat. that fat itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, because so you, you don't need a big piece of fat. Right. You just need so a little bit of fat. So there's no need for an abdominal periumbilical or a no. low abdominal etc. No. But active physical therapy, really important. And again, we'll yes. talk about that next time as well. So, so what is the fate of that fat? So does it undergo uh, structural fibrosis secondary to the uh, loading of yes. the joint? Or it undergoes fibrosis? It becomes, it becomes fibrotic. And that's why it's so important to do physical therapy. Physiotherapy. And we, we have patients doing physical therapy using an oral appliance like a therabyte or something yes. like that yes. um, for about a year uh, actively, two or three times a day. Um, and, you know, just the chewing and eating and everything. That, that thing, you know, no one, no one has done a study that I know of uh, who's looked at uh, long-term what happens to the fat. Yes. I've reoperated patients where I've put fat in uh, when we do total joints, where we've had to do a revision. And we found that it's a, it almost looks like a disc at that point uh, because it becomes a nice pad of fibrous connective tissue. What if you don't interpose at all? So what if you don't interpose at all? Just do a plain discectomy and that's about it. And then go about with physiotherapy. I think, I don't know, you probably do fine. I, I, you know, I, I just like to have something there. sounds of grating here and there and that's about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, this, yeah. You know, discectomy has been used for, you know, 50, 60 years. Uh, so... And, and there's been some reports of, particularly in the Scandinavian literature, of 30-year uh, follow-ups on these patients. And the only complaint they have is that their joint makes noise. And if you make an image, it looks terrible. But the patients seem to do OK. So you get the disc out of the way. You stop the inflammatory response. You stop the synovitis. Patients do all right. But then the bone-to-bone -bone contacts, so wouldn't that cause secondary bony issues and maybe bony erosions? If, if the patient continues with their parafunctional habits, or like I showed the variables, those variables continue, sure. And, and that's, those are the patients who end up converting to a total joint. You know, I, I'll, I'll present that very scenario in the next presentation where we talk about patients who do well with discectomy and fat, and then patients who don't do well and it's about, you know, 20% don't do well. And the reason they don't do well is they don't follow the instructions. So it's, it's an interesting... And then, and then putting in fat is so much easy. It's so much easier, right? It's the same incision. Just it's just maybe a couple of minutes extra, take that fat and put it in. So why not do it? Right. Are you, and and you, you avoid the potential problem of a SSI uh, yes, from, the, yes, from, the, yes. from taking the fat from the abdomen. <laughs> Arunjit, you had a question? We have questions. So we have some questions from our audiences. Uh, we have questions from Dr. Dinkar Reddy. He's asking, is arthroscopy, arthrocentesis, a conservative treatment or diagnostic modality is considered for this displacement? How can we, sure. use, how can we use arthroscopy? Can, uh, is it used as uh, a conservative treatment or... Uh, please well, our arthrocentesis... Yeah. Arthrocentesis is, is, a, is just flushing out all of the cytokines that I talked about, getting, getting that, that inflammatory cascade, get rid of all that stuff. Um, and you have to use a, a minimum of 100 to 150 cc's to do that. Um, but the Japanese have shown that very nicely. Uh, arthroscopy is a good diagnostic tool. Um, particularly if, if you've seen that, that in-office arthroscopy, the on point, uh, mm. the, the, you, know, it's, you don't get a really great picture, but you'll see the inflammatory response and you'll see what the posterior attachment looks like. And you'll basically okay. see, see synovitis. So it's a good diagnostic tool. It's not a good management tool or surgical tool. You need a regular joint arthroscope to do lysis and lavage, to break up the adhesions, the adhesions that we talked about, which have developed because of the synovitis. And so that's what I used it for. I used it for 
um, breaking up adhesions, um, getting the disc moving uh, so that the disc does not become the speed bump that the condyle has to go over. And again, active physical therapy afterwards to get the patients moving uh, their, their mandible. And once the disc is out of the way, once the inflammatory response is down, uh, Hilton's law goes away, and all of a sudden, magically, there's, their trismus goes away, uh, and they, they can open and function. But then, as you say that this, uh, this whole condition has to be managed, you can never treat it. So the patient may require repeated arthroscopies? Yes, because they, they may reform. And the patients, in my experience, the patients who need to be rescoped, so to speak, mm -hmm. Uh, or re-arthros and teeth are the ones who don't follow the directions. So I make it very clear with the patient that if you don't follow these instructions, this is what's going to happen. We're going to have to do this again, or you're going to end up with a joint replacement. And yes, sometimes that's, that's, the knowledge of consequences helps people to change their lifestyle. Yes. Yes. So, and, and you have to be, you know, very upfront with these patients. You have to explain to them that this is a management option. This is not a cure. And they have to understand because they come in with expectations that are greater than you can deliver. Because the first question I was always asked my total joint patients is what do you want out of this operation? And the number one thing they would say was I want my pain removed. I said, I can't do that. I cannot take your pain away. Okay, I can get your mouth open wider. I can get you to eat food better. I can, you know, I can reduce your pain, but I cannot take your pain away. And so that expectation has to go away from day one. So the same thing with, with TMD patients, the expectation of cure has to go away day one. And if they don't like it, I tell them there's the door, don't let them hit you in the behind as you walk out. And you know, makes my life easier. I don't have to deal with unhappy patients. And the word of mouth that they spread, that this doctor can't you know, treat you, and probably the negative uh, influence that comes on the doctor's practice, particularly for those who are in the private practice. An unhappy patient going out of your office can be quite uh, bad for your practice. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's better to keep the expectations in place. Yeah. Correct. Because yeah. the problems that we see in most of these patients, or the patients that I would see, because I, you know, and like you all, I'm, I was at a university. Uh, a, a tertiary care center, you don't see the simple cases. You see yeah. the very complex cases because they've been through all of that. And they'll come and they'll say, well, oh, Dr. So-and-so said he would cure my pain. Well, I said, well, that was the first mistake. <laughs> so, you know, so we see a, a, a much different population. So we become a little bit more jaded, but we have the experience to explain to the younger surgeons who are going to go out and into private practice or into academic surgery, that this is the way you should manage these patients. You know, don't promise the world to them because you can't deliver it. So we have another question from Dr. Darpan Mehta, who's a dear friend of mine from UK. He would like to know, what about an MRI from a medical legal point of view prior to doing an open joint procedure? Again, if you're in a, in a litigious state, um, you probably would get an MRI. But um, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. And if you're only doing it for medical legal reasons, I don't think that's correct. You, we should practice medicine the right way. Okay? Uh, and, and not because the lawyer says we should do it. But if you're in a litigious state, I can understand why people do that. Um, and, you know, that's fine. That's, if that's, you feel comfortable doing it that way, it's fine with me. But I don't think you need an MRI on every patient. Sonal, do we have any other questions for sir? Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, say a patient has a pre-existing TMD. Uh, and this is a uh, uh, case plan being planned for elective orthognathic surgery. So now the question is that does one treat the TMD first or do we do the OGS first, assuming that as the occlusion, the skeletal relationship is the cause of the, the, the uh, disc, uh, issues, 
if we do it by OGS, then the ID would kind of be sorted out on its own. So, you know, in this kind of yeah. question, do, do we treat the ID first or do we treat the, uh, do we do the automatic surgery first? Yeah, I, I'm, uh, excellent question. And um, I have a whole presentation on this as well. Um, but um, the bottom line is you, you manage the pain first. You manage the TMD first before you do the orthognathic surgery. And you know, there have been a number of studies done on does orthognathic surgery help or worsen TMD? And it's a toss up. <laughs> no one, you know, it's 50 50 whether it helps or it doesn't. Um, or whether it hurts. Um, and I think that there's some really nice papers on this subject that talk about the, the real factor here is if you do orthognathic surgery wrong, okay? If, if, okay. if you don't get the condyle in the right position, if you don't get the segments in the right position, if you get the occlusion wrong, you, you know, and it, yeah, you're going to get TMD problems. Okay, because the occlusion is wrong. Um, but if you do orthognathic surgery correctly, get the condyle in the right position, get good bridging fixation, on and on and on and on, good orthodontics, good occlusion, um, you can still get TMD problems. So there's no there's no right answer. The, the right answer seems to be you do you manage the TMD problem first using orthotics or whatever okay. arthroscopy, you know, and then move on. There's an algorithm that's really uh, well done by um, uh, his name. I can send you the reference um, where he talks. He has got an algorithm for how you manage this displacement without reduction, this displacement with reduction in terms of the algorithm down to uh, orthognathic surgery with and without total joint replacement. Um, gosh, what's his name? Anyway, I can't. I can't recall it right now. You can share with us the reference. Yeah, yeah. And so, so that patient that you uh, spoke about, the graphic artist. So you know, kind of going back, if he had known that this was not the problem, so what would you have done differently, sir? Her temporal headaches apparently still remained even after ten years. So what is it that we missed, or what would we have done differently? Um, the, the 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 graphic artist. Yes, yes. Would I have so done for her? That's your fictional patient, isn't it, sir? So that's your fictional patient, right? Yeah, no, no. but what would I have done yeah, with her from the beginning? Sir. I would, I would have told her that her her headache had nothing to do with her TMJ. Wait, mm. And I mean, I used to see, in a week, I would probably see, I don't know, 30 or 40 TMJ patients, because my whole practice was TMJ towards the end. Um, and of that, I'd say 10%. Would be patients like this um, that would come in and you know I have this headache and my dentist told me I should have the surgery done. I tell them no, you, you don't need the surgery done. Well, my disc is displaced. So what? Mine is displaced too. So what? You know, I'm saving you an operation. Go away. You know, so, go, so don't I go think back to other... that doctor. <laughs> So I think so. We are medicalizing a lot of our patients, right? A lot of our patients don't need to be medicalized. They just need to be reassured that the the problem is not uh, that significant to be, you know, getting so anxious about, and they themselves can handle it by reducing their anxiety. But instead, what we are doing is we are seeing these patients. We are we are giving them a diagnosis. We are trying to even suggest some treatment plans which don't work. So basically, we are medicalizing them, right? Is that what I mean, you would say? I mean, if, 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 we, if we only believe, like um, Clyde Wilkes, that the disc is the answer to the whole thing, we have a hammer. So every okay. patient that walks in is a nail. nail. And we hit them with, with surgery. Okay, and that's where we made our mistake. We made that mistake. I mean, I made that mistake over 400 times. Okay, I'll admit it. <laughs> um, fortunately, you know, those patients ultimately, you know, did have to manage them correctly. They did all right, but the disc, disc surgery didn't do it. So if I can just have add a couple more questions, I don't think we have time. 
Yes, uh, I think we'll have, we have have uh, five more minutes. Yes, yes five yes, five yes. to ten minutes minute more. So, uh, so you said, uh, and this is are the pearls that the joint tissue or the synovitis basically leads to the muscle spasm, the MPDS part through the trigeminal nerve, the Hilton's nerve. Now, maybe uh, can it? It can probably be the other way around also that the MPDS may cause. MPDS, which is, which is uh, can cause joint issues. Maybe there is some micro trauma, or there are some parafunctional habits existing, and that can cause MPDS. And then the MPDS can cause uh, disc issues. Does that also happen? So in case that is happening, it's either this leading to that or that leading to this. How do we distinguish between the two? And therefore, what do we treat first? Well, the I mean that's where the local anesthetic block comes in handy. Ah. You can find out. If, if the primary source is the muscle or the joint, number one. Number two is the imaging, okay? Uh, as I'll talk about in the next talk about osteoarthritis, I mean, if the joint is torn up and looks terrible, <laughs> okay, then th you know that that's, that's the problem. I and mean, you can do the diagnostic block, but I can tell you in 100% of the stage four uh, arthritic joint, it's going to take the pain away because that joint is just perpetually um, under attack by the uh, cytokines uh, because it's just a, it's a, well, the way I used to explain this to patients, I would take a tongue blade and break it and with my fingers and it gets all jagged and I would run it on their hand and say, this is what's happening in your joint. And look at your hand now, see how red it got from all those sharp points hitting your hand, okay? And patients like to see stuff like that. You know, I would do drawings and, you know, show them a smooth end of the tongue blade running on their hand. See, your hand doesn't, doesn't have a red spot, but that, that rough tongue blade, see, that's what's happening in your joint. So you explain those things to patients. And the more you can explain to patients, the better off they understand it, and the better off they're, they're going to be in, in terms of the result. So yeah, basically that, that empowering the patient. Yeah, yeah. And uh, lastly, sir, what do you see as the future of the disc in terms of regeneration? Stem cells, do stem cells or uh, tissue engineering does that have any role uh, in maybe regenerating the disc someday? Is are there any studies going on? Yeah, well, there's been a lot of work done with the PRP, you know, hmm. and, and then it's get plus and minus with PRP. We'll talk about that next time too. Um, We'll talk about the stem cells. Um, the thing that uh, you know, I had been working with a group, or a couple groups, on the development of a, of a bioengineered disc. Right. Um, my problem with the bioengineered disc is how do we attach it? You know, um, <laughs> do, we, do we attach it to the fossa? Do we attach it to the condyle? Um, so there's been some work done, particularly at the uh, University of Pittsburgh on this. And I think they have a grant now uh, to do some work in patients where they attach the disc, uh, the artificial disc uh, to the fossa. But my question is based on our results with discectomy, why do we need a disc? And what's gonna happen to that you know, in the long run? Um, we just don't know. Same with uh, bioengineered total joints. Um, I mean, that's, that's not going to happen in my lifetime. I mean, you guys are young enough, that may happen, but it, it took us um, 10 years to get a total joint approved here in the United States, and that's metal and plastic. When you're talking about cells, you're talking about a whole other issue with FDA approval. So it could take 20 years. 20 years, I'll be uh, up in the clouds somewhere, <laughs> not here. And the PRP that you were talking about, so what is the ideal uh, material for disco supplementation, the supplementation that you use? PRP or injectable PRF, early days, there was hyaluronic acid, and then steroids were used initially, and then they were not used because they themselves produce cyanomatis. Yeah, so, yeah well, is, again, we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about that later. next time. All yeah, right. We'll go into that in some detail, because sure. those are the kinds of things that have been used for osteoarthritis, TMJ yeah. osteoarthritis. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about those next time. And uh, Dr. Um, Warburton will be with us next time, correct? Yes, sir. 
he has Good. agreed to be with us for the next session with you and i'm sure we will have a much more amazing discussions as we have had today i hope that our audiences have enjoyed this evening and morning on your side uh, and i hope that you have enjoyed your experience of being with in the audience this side thank I you have, so I, much you know i always say that i um, i learn more um than i probably give to uh to these presentations because the questions that are asked um spark more inquiry looking around yeah. for me yeah. to do yeah. so thank you thank you very much to all of you and certainly for the uh the time that you spent with me today and i look forward to being with it's you next absolute, month it's an absolute pleasure all mine and all ours and i request my uh, audiences today in case if your questions have not been answered please join my tmd group on telegram or leave your questions for me or so directly to his email id and i'm sure you'll get your answers and let's continue this process of learning through uh, discussions and conversations with learned people like dr mercury even in the future thank you sonal and thank you dr mercury thank you Namaste. thank you so much yeah thank you goodbye yeah. goodbye